Trenches, Alpha, Battlefield Tactics and Attacks, and how these are capable by the teams. Beginning with the obvious, of how, of course, the game is generally understood, is what we'll be covering in this video. Of course, how to go offensive in the game, and how this is mostly possible throughout it. Once again, at the beginning of the video, I would like to ask if anyone isn't subscribed, feel absolutely free to, I would really appreciate it. We are a smaller channel, obviously, but it does help me a ton and my community. I do also live stream over on Twitch, twitch.tv slash yakare. If anyone does want to join in, feel absolutely free to. Thank you guys, and let's get right into it. We'll begin with the obvious question of when. When to go offensive in the game is when obviously your team is on the upper hand of things, that you're not being defensive, that the enemy has no defenses, basically fortifications, which are mostly classified by the artillery, as well as what we'll call for the moment a firebox, as I made the joke last time as to what they really are, which are turrets. Um, but essentially those are very important to get rid of, usually having an ATP past day three to my knowledge, is when those are available, which essentially get laser blasters to go knock out the enemy and of course use those guys to destroy their defenses so when all of that is done is when you should have the ability to push if you're trying to push through that the odds of more than 30 to 40 percent of your team actually surviving through those fortifications is pretty low so what you're going to want to try to do is obviously knock out those fortifications so it falls mostly on the players to make an attempt to kill you in the process before you're going offensive or whilst you're going offensive which is usually a better choice than having to go up against AI aimbot, which is a good idea. What is an offensive tactic? Overall, what is an offensive tactic is mostly classified by what the strategy of the map is. All maps are RNG generated at the beginning of the game. This makes very beautiful maps. Of course, there is some scripting behind that to make sure that it would be more of an even battlefield, depending on the game mode and other things that consistently go on throughout. So what is a strategy to go offensive in the first place? Understanding a basic strategy of when to go offensive mostly comes from what your team's circumstance is at the current time and how many men that you're essentially going to have in a certain trench line ready to push up. And that is what is allowing you to go offensive and go on the attack rather than being on the defensive is usually having the majority. Now there are exceptions to this such as I mentioned before the fortifications which can alter if a person should be able to push or not in most circumstances, but as long as you have the higher numbers, in most cases you will be able to push up, and sometimes having those fortifications help the enemy team, so make sure to take those out first. An offensive tactic is generally also put into perspective on what the map becomes, which a lot of the time is taken from the map being RNG generated, which means that every time that a new map comes out, it is normally at the beginning of the game, and this will essentially RNG generate and create a difficult circumstance for people to be able to go into on the battlefield. Usually it's going to be an uphill battle towards the center of the map, and when you reach the enemy fortification or base, it's going to be a pretty difficult place to get to, so what you're going to want to do is have a majority of numbers as stated before. Usually taking into perspective a three-pronged attack or a two-pronged attack as to actually going forwards, especially with communication on the team through either team chat or if you're doing a Discord VC, that is also pretty useful for this game. So I would recommend doing one of those following while you are playing Trenches Alpha, especially in groups, because it's a lot easier to be able to take an enemy trench from more than one perspective due to the fact that enemies typically, if they have good fortifications, engineers, or anyone else essentially guarding a certain trench, and there may be explosives or landmines in the area, it's going to be very, very difficult to approach a very certain area. They can consistently hold, however, if they're firing two angles at the same time, usually crossfire ends up with the enemy team losing that fight, which would allow you, of course, to go on the attack. So offensive capabilities are generally taken into perspective on what you will be able to do on the credit system of the game, which means how many tanks does your team have, how much... LMG, SMG, Carbine, or other classes that your team generally has overall, that is something that you do need to understand prior to going into the fight. Meaning, if your team has maybe two or three people that are using anything better than riflemen, your offensive capabilities are next to none. However, if you are trying to look at it through the lens of having two behemoths alongside three people that are using SMGs, alongside an ATP and an engineer, your pushing capabilities are going to be significantly higher. So understanding tanks and more expensive units and classes are generally going to help you push more. So having more credits generally means that your team is going to push harder or more. 
However, there are circumstances that come into effect, such as stealing a tank or a tank gets damaged or someone inside gets killed, but they recover the tank, or let's for example, the uh, cruisers. If that happens, a tide for a more expensive class can be turned the other way, meaning sometimes that can actually be to the deficit of your own team, but that's so incredibly scarce that it's not really worth going over that. And just saying overall, the more expensive your kit class is and the more people you have, such as an engineer, a, for example, ATP, or you have anyone else that's going to be in a more expensive circumstance, protect those people if you are using rifleman class and then allow them to push with you on the backside of it or try to be in front of them so you can take the bullets for them because they're going to be the main pushing force, not you in that circumstance. And if you are that person, then you're going to be the pushing force, so make sure to be behind people, because they will generally understand that and let you go behind them. Now, one of the biggest understandings of the battlefield, as I make the joke about the fireboxes or the turrets, as well as the artillery, is you have to understand how exactly long these do actually take to make. And on average, we will say that it's going to take you approximately 180 to 240 seconds to actually make one of these. This varies depending, of course, on how many engineers are actually building one, but for the moment we're saying solo, so approximately three to four minutes is how long it's going to actually take you to build one of these, and that is an incredibly long period of time in uh, perspective of the entirety of it, and of co also comparing the fireboxes, turrets, do get upgraded quite a bit to actually get to a level where it would be good at 300%. It is significantly more time, meaning 9 to up to even 12 minutes is an extensive period of time when you're talking about this for building something like that as a solo engineer in the game to be able to benefit your team. Therefore, sometimes fortifications, taking those out first with an ATP or a tank or of some sort, or cruiser even, is extremely useful because those do and are worth their time for an engineer to actually go build. So it is very highly recommended that you destroy fortifications or you build fortifications dependent on your situation. But make sure you have as many fortifications as possible pointed at the enemy team, usually on your side of the hill, because you can fire down on defenses that you've left there, but you can't fire up on defenses that are behind an enemy line. So it's going to be more difficult if they are built on a downward slope than an upward slope. So make sure to build your defenses on an upward slope for the most part, or on top of the hill, because that's going to be your best place, possibly destroying them if it's necessary and if they push you. And also, if you are advancing, it will also be very useful to have them in that position anyways, because they'll be firing down the enemy line. Between the benefits of ATP and an engineer class, there are some disputes as to what it's actually worth. Meaning an ATP obviously can get you more kills than an engineer is in that life, however if the engineer builds a turret it's going to do significantly higher amounts depending on where it is, up to maybe 30-40 kills, probably within its life until someone ends up blowing it up, is a significantly higher amount than pretty much anybody as a solo person is going to be able to do in a singular life in the game. So, Engineer actually does outvalue ATP in using it as a normal class, but using ATP at a time when there are enough fortifications, or there is enough built up to where you no longer have to worry about that as a circumstance, you're definitely going to want to use an ATP class as much as possible, or some sort of SMG, which is actually fairly cheap, it's 200, or using even a carbine, which essentially is an SMG with a lightly lower damage and also fires quite a few rounds. So. Carbine is my favorite infantry class that I would recommend using. It comes into effect on day five as a heads up. So that is something that I would recommend looking into, of course, and trying to use that as much as possible to your advantage and your team's advantage prior to going into the battlefield and as you are in the battlefield, actually. Now, of course, managing the trenches. Trenches is something that I don't even build myself because I am too lazy to do it throughout the primary part of the game. However, building trenches at the beginning of the game when you have double speed, and of course you can be an engineer, is pretty useful because that's four times building speed than anyone else is going to be able to build that. So, of course, be an engineer at the beginning of the game while it's still in the grace period of two and a half minutes, and then you'll have the opportunity to have a decent trench line. Using trenches, of course, with the little boxes on top, I don't know how to describe them, but trenches with a little space in them, try to build those roughly every 20 or so trench spaces or trench lines going down because that's going to be pretty useful, and you don't want them to be too common because those can be used defensively against you, and using them defensively is not that much of a benefit, really. It's just enough to have you in there just in case artillery is firing down at the current time and you need to wait that out, or someone else essentially is already pretty low in health, they can go in there for the time being while you continue to fight if that is necessary at the time, or they're not as good of a kid as you and you're pretty close to hitting an enemy base. 
I have had examples of maps where the hills go incredibly high towards where the enemy flag is, and they have multiple layers of barbed wire going around it. So there are examples and times where it would be pretty useful to have those box top trench lines and, you know, an officer's square essentially is what I would call it. But that is very useful at times, but it is more recommended that you build less of those than you build more of those because that is pretty much a deficit to your team. Another point to bring up throughout all of this, of course, is tank defenses and other things in the battlefield that you must understand in advance. Obviously, coiling around the barbed wire around a couple rings of the flag is a pretty smart idea. Sometimes using your backside, of course, so that, you know, you're not going to get encircled and they're not going to push in from the back. So building some of those water slabs that usually walk over or, you know, those little boxes that go over the trenches so that the tanks can go over them too. Make sure that you use those to get over your own barbed wire and get into your flag if you ever need to reclaim it or protect it at times. However, using that against the enemy is also something that is pretty useful, so recommending that as well, obviously. Tank defenses, however, are something that do need to be talked about time to time. Obviously, the giant iron X's are something that you should be able to build, blocking out the tanks from moving forwards, which building quite a few of those, usually closest as possible to where the enemy is, is pretty good. Because if they cannot move their tanks past where they are, you'll be able to destroy them before they're able to move forwards, and from there, your offensive capabilities are going to be significantly higher. So make sure that in any way is possible, if you are an engineer, that you are building as many trench lines for your team as possible, as many defenses around your flag, fortifications, and everything else. So engineers are incredibly important with offensive capabilities, and even more so in defensive capabilities. Guns don't always matter as much as the player and what they are capable of actually fighting. So try to make sure that when you do have an engineer on your team that you're protecting them more so than anything else, including your own flag, because if they are alive and they are building the defenses that you cannot make when you're not an engineer, they're going to be more useful to your team than you are shooting an enemy that's about to walk back in. So with all this information, it gives you a lot of options as to what you could possibly be doing towards your team and the enemy team to make sure that you are winning the game over the other team. Thank you guys for watching. I appreciate it very, very much. Be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. I would appreciate that a ton. Of course, these videos are doing very, very well on my channel at the moment, and I appreciate all of your support. I do hope to upload much more often. I do stream on Twitch, twitch.tv slash yakarate, if anyone wants to go follow that. I do also have a Reddit server, which you guys are more than welcome to post on, and I just started that. If anyone happens to be interested, feel free to join into that. I would appreciate it a ton. So thank you guys very much, and I will see you guys next time.